Grace and Peace United Church and welcome to worship this Sunday. We have a few, few events coming up in the near future in our church. One of them is our Church Bazaar, 28th of October. Come join us from about Hopper State, uh, egg and bacon roll, or you can come and have some tea and cake. Look at our second-hand clothing store or the white elephant. It's always a lot of fun to come and join in on the day. So bring your wallet to come and join in our, in our Church Bazaar 28th. We have our church golf day coming up in November. It's uh, going to be good fun. So look at the press. We'll have a slide up and you'll be able to see when it is. And uh, then, of course, we're coming towards the end of the year. We have a quiz night early in November. And then we also have a um, Thanksgiving day with a prayer day at the end of November. All those dates will be up and uh, you'll be able to find out about them. Our first reading of this morning comes out of the book of Philippians and I'll be reading from chapter 4 verse 1 to 9 Therefore my brothers and sisters you whom I love and long for my joy and crown that is how you should stand firm in the Lord dear friends I plead with Yehudia and I plead with Sintiche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke people, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to the God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Our second reading comes out of the book of Psalms, and I'll be reading Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Um, This week in the Psalms, um, I've just uh, at this point departed from our um, theme we've been on in the book of Matthew, the red letter edition of the book of Matthew. And we're going to be just looking at some comforting scriptures over the next few weeks. Now, in a few weeks' time, we've got Rod Bosses coming to share with us again, and uh, you're looking forward to that, I'm sure. And uh, then towards the end of the year, we'll have um, the Advent starting, and we'll be looking at lighting the Advent wreath all over again. But in the meantime, we're looking at the Psalm 23 and Philippians 4. Both um, powerfully encouraging scriptures. So just as an aside, we were looking at the book of Romans this week and we were, we were discussing the idea of passion, a passion for, for God and a passion for his, um, his law. Um, Romans chapter 10 talks about the Jewish people as having zeal for the Torah, zeal for the law. But Paul says they have zeal but no knowledge which we talked about as being a bizarre concept because the Jewish young boys in the time of Jesus, and by the age of 12, they would have known the entire Torah, the first five books of the Bible, off by heart. And so to say they had no knowledge was a strange thing to say. 
But what's interesting about that word for knowledge that Paul uses, it's an unusual form of the word for knowledge. The word gnosko is the usual word for knowledge, a word from which we get gnosis, um, the Gnostic movement of the early, um, the early current eras around the first to third century AD. And um, the Gnostic movement is something from which we get the Gnostic Gospels, just a, um, not Christian, but almost um, you know, very similar themes. But um, Paul uses this word, epigenosko, and it's a word of experience. In fact, um, the, the Kittel Dictionary of the Greek language talks about it as being an experience now which gives us hope for the future or impacts our future. And the, the kind of picture I had in my mind as we talked about it, this, just imagine one day we, we hear that there's going to be a, a special news bulletin well, it's an on, on the news and all channels are going to carry it and it's going to feature Jacob Zuma. He's going to come on TV. And just imagine he does, the whole nation watching 7 o'clock or whatever it is in the after, evening and uh, uh, on comes Jacob Zuma and humbly and through tears he begins to confess his part in all that has happened in South Africa and, and then begins to share how having done what he's done he wants to give back, he wants to rebuild, he wants to reconstruct and to give back to the country. Now imagine that speech, imagine what would happen in the hearts of South Africans. That experience of a leader um, humbly confessing and coming clean would, would impact the way we looked at the future of South Africa. If, if that happened then with a number of other leaders who also came um, to the country and said, we, we have um, acted detrimentally towards the country and we'd like to set it right. Just, this is a miracle, incidentally, that I pray for, if not daily, at least weekly, uh, that something like this would happen in our country. But imagine it happens. You see, that experience on, at that moment will change the hearts of South Africa in terms of the way we look at the future. And that's what Paul's talking about. He says somebody who truly knows God, epigenoscus, who, who experiences God's salvation through Jesus Christ, through his spirit, it's it, this salvation becomes real for them as they confess Jesus as Lord and believe God raised them from the dead. The, this salvation of Jesus will become real in their hearts, not only now, but for the future. It'll change the way they think about the future. So if you can just catch that idea as faith, and this is the way that David approaches this psalm, Psalm 23. It's a, it's a now experience which impacts how we think about the future. Folks, this is faith. This is the faith of the Bible. It's an experience of God through Jesus Christ right now, an experience of a relationship, an intimate relationship with God, which changes the way we think about the future. The Lord is my shepherd, David says. If the Lord is my shepherd, it changes everything. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. Now, um, poor shepherd boy is sitting um, under a tree, perhaps chewing a piece of grass, watching his sheep, you know, he doesn't have a heck of a lot. He's maybe got a little bag with some bread and, and perhaps some cheese or curds in it. And, um, and then he might have to hunt for his food, forage for food while he's not at home. He, he doesn't have a heck of a lot. And so um, for him to say shall not be in want is something peculiar. He clearly has an experience of God that God looks after him. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now for, for sheep, to lie down in green pastures. It means they've finished grazing. grazing. They've had enough. They are full, these sheep, lying down in, in a place of, of provision, a place where they experience enough. Not, not scarcity, but an enough. And he leads me beside still waters. It's important that they're still, because, of course, water in Old Testament terms was a dangerous place. You know, the sea was the place of the great Le Leviathan. Um, the great rivers God had to part for the people of Israel to move through and so the waters were, were just dangerous as they were for sheep you know sheep washed away and even drowned in a river so for the Lord to lead us beside quiet waters it's a it's a place where we're refreshed but it's safe so what is that place for you that place of oh, this is just safe is there a place in your life were you safe or can you identify places where it's not safe? But for some of us, it's even with our family members. You know, we may feel we're not sure that we can really trust them with the depth of our emotion. And perhaps for some of us, it's our workplace or 
um, perhaps it's a place we have to go um, regularly. We don't feel safe. But the Lord has said there's something about walking with him, following him, that can bring us deep within us, this place of safety, which will, will not trouble us, will not allow us to be overwhelmed by what's around us, but will restore our soul. In, in Philippians 4, Paul puts it like this, he says, um, present your prayers with thanksgiving, and then he says, the peace of God, which passes understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And um, just it, it, sometimes we're, we're just in a terrifying place, and yet when we commit that place to the Lord, when we realize that the, the shepherd, the good shepherd is leading us, God can give us this deep sense of shalom in that space. Remember, of course, that sheep are community animals. They don't very often do things on their own. If they do, they need to be fetched because they're going to get into trouble, we, we read in the Gospel of John. And, and so the, this community aspect of being a sheep is that we, we need to be together. We need to be with other Christians. And it's in that space of being with other Christians, with the Lord, that he restores us all. He leads me in right paths for him, his namesake. And this is this is just for me. You know, I, I grew up in a, um, a fairly conservative Christian environment where where rules, laws were important, and I constantly thought, you know, I've got to get this right. I've got to get this right. I've got to get this right. And and I, I would put a lot of pressure on myself. And some of us do. We we harden ourselves about obedience and about getting it right. This is fantastic. David gets it that he leads us in the right paths for his namesake. And, and folks, this is something we need to do. We need to submit our way to the Lord and our, our plans will succeed, says the writer, writer of Proverbs. Or, or in the Psalms, it says, in, a, in his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines the next step. The Lord is the one who leads us into his right place. Um, the big thing about this epigenosis that Paul speaks about in Philippians is that it's a, an experience of God and a knowledge of God deep within that will inform what happens into the future. He calls us into a place of intimacy. Now, I love the next verse, verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley. Now, the, the Hebrew word for that is tol maveth. Tol maveth. It's a valley of deathly darkness. It's, it's about a place where it's, it's terrifying. The outcome is unknown, um, even threatening. And we're not sure. We just don't know. And the interesting thing about this is prior to this, the shepherd had been leading. The she shepherd is the one who leads us into this place of green pastures and quiet waters. But th this place, even though I walk. So this is a choice. This is my choice to walk outside of the goodness of God's plan. Even if I do not follow the shepherd into this place of green pastures and, and still waters, I need fear no evil. I need fear, not fear that evil will overwhelm me for, and this is beautiful, look at this, look what happens here. From, from David addressing us as if, as if he's addressing us, saying, um, this is what the Lord is to me, here's my shepherd, and even if I walk through this place um, of deathly darkness, I will fear no evil. He, he changes to, from addressing us to addressing the Lord. It, it's a place of worship. When we truly understand who God is and how desperately we need him because we walk in our own, uh, often walk into our own deathly darkness. When we understand where we are, we find ourselves face down in worship. We find ourselves turning to him. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's a beautiful image, you know, of the rod of discipline and the staff of help. You know, the staff was a, a kind of crook where the shepherd would, would draw the sheep back into a place of safety. But the rod was one that, you know, you could clip the ankles with to, to make sure the sheep went in the right way. And love this. Comfort me. That discipline, does discipline comfort you? Does, does it comfort you to know that, that you need to be in the right place? And when somebody says to you, 
um, can I work with you and help you in to the right? I'm talking about a friend or a confidant, not not just a stranger, because just don't do that. You know, don't try and discipline somebody with whom you have no relationship. That's that's can be quite brutal and and hurtful. But if it's someone you know well, when somebody comes to you and says, "Can do you mind if I just help you with this thing or that thing?" Are we in a place of feeling comfort? Lord, this is working to make me better. Or do we resist it? Because the place of the good sheep is to invite the Lord's correction so that we head in the right direction. Uh, this next bit, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Well, of course, cup overflowing is just, you know, the Lord gives me so much. I'm so thankful for And I'm thankful for, for our elders at United Church. I'm thankful for the pastoral care team. I, I'm thankful for you as, as our United Church members who are, who, we just love each other and, and we encourage one another and work with one another um, for your generosity and care, for, even for those who hurt you, that you care. But this, this is something we give thanks for. But Here's the thing, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, I'd always thought when I grew up that this was a place of bragging. David's saying, you know, my enemies will stand and see how much I've got and they'll be jealous. Well, that's not what the, I think the scriptures are saying. I think David is saying there will be a feast, a feast of unity, a feast of reconciliation between those who have been estranged. And that is the table the Lord is preparing for me. He's bringing my enemies back home as friends. Now, can you imagine the feast of reconciliation if our country were able to come together? If those who have hurt one another, those who have hurt the nation, were able to confess and to be brought together in a feast. That's a feast I want to be part of. And, I, and it's a feast at we, which we will experience the anointing, the, the healing oil being poured over us as God heals. Folks, let's make that a prayer for ourselves and for our country and for the world, um, perhaps even um, starting with the Middle East right now. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord. Now this is where the epigenosis comes in. Um, David's experience of God's shepherding him right now is one of intimacy and care. A care, such amazing care that even in the place where he's walking away and into a place of death and darkness, God, um, God protects him. Um, his experience of God is so powerfully protect protective that... Um, in this moment, he can say that goodness and mercy will pursue him. Pursue is the word, incidentally. Follow. We talk about follow the leader, you know, just walking behind someone. This word for follow is to pursue. The, the grace, the mercy, the love of God will pursue him all the days of, our, of, of his life. Oh, that's a beautiful thing to think. That the, Lord, the Lord does not allow us to walk away from him. So often Christians say to me, you know, I, I was at a time when I felt far from the Lord. Well, it's impossible. The Lord pursues us, Psalm 139, even, even if I go to the far side of the sea, there you are, and when I wake, I'm still with you. Um, the, Lord, um, the Lord doesn't amble on behind us, hoping that we'll turn around, but he pursues us, and, and like, a, like a, a, a full back tackling the winger as he goes to score a try, he takes us down, and he loves us once again. Sometimes I in the mornings, I dive onto the bed and I wrestle my boys awake. It's that kind of just engagement. You know, the Lord won't leave us alone for the rest of our lives. He'll be there engaging. This is the kind of shepherd that I follow, and I hope you follow too. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Well, some scripture, some verses say forever, forever. Um, and that's the fact, you know, that our, our faith now, our awareness of the shepherding of God into these safe places right now is what feeds our hope of the future and the, what God has in store for us. For, folks, I pity the person who has no experience of the shepherd now, because what must the future look like for them? But for those who trust in the shepherd, this peace which passes understanding will guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. May you... May you turn around and see this pursuing Lord following you. May you experience the feast at which there is reconciliation between those who have been estranged. And may you experience dwelling in the very presence and house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the images that David, the psalmist, brings us. Thank you that there are images which 
promise a future in your hands. And we pray that as we, we just learn to trust you with our future, that you would truly guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. For we commit our future to you. We commit the future of our country, of our families, of our loved ones. In Jesus' name. Amen. For the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen.